Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, I'm Anchika Varma and I run a small initiative called Offset Projects. Um, we started uh, this series of virtual conversations um, somewhere in the midst of the pandemic called uh, the Guftagu Talk series. And the idea behind it is actually to bring about conversations with artists, with publishers, uh, with people from the bookmaking fraternity to talk about their process, their journeys within books and outside of books as well. And, um, and the idea is hopefully to have this as, a, as an archive that's accessible to students, to photographers and non-photographers and, and as probably a bit of a guide or a leading to reading images. Um, we've been very, very lucky that from this month onwards, um, the Guftagu Talk series has been supported by the Swiss Arts Council, uh, the Pro Helvetia uh, Department and uh, Head Office in New Delhi. And, um, and hopefully there'll be many more exciting things to come out from this conversation. Um, I'm just gonna start straight into this. We're joined uh, by, uh, with Arko Datto, who's joining us from Calcutta. And um, Arko's, well, thankfully come back to India. I know he was stranded in France for, for a while during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, Arko is an artist working out of, um, well, who is based in Calcutta, but I think works out of pretty much anywhere and everywhere his interests take him. Um, he's been working on largely issues uh, related to um, ecology, to social structures. And I think a lot of his work for me is kind of like an investigation into social cultural institutions, but through a, through a very defined political perspective as well. And I'm super happy to have this conversation with him today where you all can be a part of it and hopefully join in on the conversation. Um, about 40 to 45 minutes after the conversation, we'll open out to a Q&A section. You can actually address your questions to the chat uh, that's, uh, that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, please place your questions there and we'll pick up from there and, and start addressing them as we go forward. Hi, Arko. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Anshika. <laughs> Hi. How is how's things going with you? How is yeah. Carol? Well, I mean, I've been, as you, as you mentioned, I was in France for residency for three months, and then that stretched to become an almost six-month adventure in the end right. uh, because of the lockdown, and I couldn't come back. And uh, so I've been back. It's been about a month right now. So there was mm -hmm. like a period of quarantine and then I'm yeah. sort of there. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and the residency, well, thankfully it was not one where you were actively photographing, but actually probably putting together uh, the, you know, your Shunya Raja project, right? Yeah. Right. And I mean, congratulations, you've just received a grant for a film on Picnic. So that is something I'm quite excited to see as well. Um, we'll talk yeah, about it. So as we as we go into this but i think um to just start off um i think we'll get straight into the deep end of it and let's if i mean from a practice point of view you know i've of course i've known you for a little bit of time i've known about your photographs and your projects in process i've seen them exhibited we've seen you as a curator we've seen you as um a filmmaker now over the last couple of years you've also been experimenting with that format um, and in many ways it's interesting to see how what you're addressing remains central but like there's there's almost like a play in mediums and yet um, like I don't want to say issues but the concepts and the ideas that you're um, motivated by remain consistent and and very often that kind of comes under this dynamic of, of long-term projects. And uh, I mean, I think what I wanted to actually start with is to talk about what it means to, to invest yourself into this, into a particular subject for an extended period of time and what that does to your practice or how that 
fuels your practice, but maybe also the different kinds of stimulants that come along the way to give it its own life in many ways? Yeah, I think it's it's very much related to the way I look at my practice, which in the beginning was very much more photographic, let's say. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so um, I came back from my studies in photography in Denmark. I was doing um, my studies there. I came back in the beginning of 2014, which right. is also when, which kind of is a watershed moment in the history of India, because that's when okay. electorally, let's say, you know the 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 Hindutva combine ecosystem kind of came right. to democratic political power in this country. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the projects that I've been doing from then, so I launched myself into this uh, into a multitude of projects which have sort of developed over time. So right. they ended up being long term projects, not by I not by necessity. I would say it's just I mean it's just how they have been and how I kind of look at projects. There's no real necessity to end them in a sense like to mm -hmm. force an end on them so right. uh, so I continue as long as I deem fit and in the end like they end up like you keep finding new things that keep cropping up new perspectives new possibilities um, so that's how uh, a lot of them end up being long-term projects for example like I was looking at picnics so that's a very seasonal thing so I only work on that during the months of December and January let's say so mm -hmm. you know I'm not so it's a long-term project in a, in a very specific way, which right. is an annual occurrence, let's say. Mm -hmm. Or say a project on the Diwali, which is also something which is five days every year. So yeah. uh, it, it ends up becoming a long-term project in a sense that, you know, I'm looking at it every year, but right. it's for a very specific amount of time. Right. But then also, as you mentioned, Shunno Raja, which is a project on climate change, um, and it's developed, in, it's become a a trilogy of three separate visually and conceptually disparate projects mm -hmm. right now. And, uh, and that they became that because of a very long term engagement with the subject and with my interest in exploring the site of climate change in different ways. Right. And uh, that came out of like a very long standing engagement with the Bengal Delta where I've been going back and forth uh, multiple times because it's also very close to the place I am where I live right. in Calcutta. So you know, there's mm -hmm. a logistical um, possibility of like spending and investing a lot of time and really understanding what, you know, to gain perspectives that would be deeper or more insightful than say like a parachuting uh, work of photography, let's say. So mm -hmm. I think that's very important. And then also, I think with a long term project, what's very interesting for me, which I kind of explored more in the mannequin project, for example, uh, which looks at India and in, during the nighttime, and it's a flash imagery based project, it was my sort of first developed flash based project, mm -hmm. the first part of a trilogy also. Um, uh, for me, like, because I was looking at that as an engagement starting from that 2014 watershed moment, let's say, yeah. through that project, you kind of explore the, the way the, the zeitgeist of the time, the way the paranoia and like, you know, the fear in society sort of pervades. And you have the sense of suspicion on the streets a lot of the times. Yeah. And you have a fear of getting lynched. You have a fear of being labeled, I don't know, a child kidnapper or something, you know, and these are things which are the reality of the country. And then these things sort of seep into the project in very, uh, in very uh, interesting ways, let's say. So that's how like the long term right. projects built. Yeah. And um, for, for better or for worse, the, the continuation of a particular political power is, is helped in many ways, maybe for, for these projects also to, to expand and extend over a period of time, because I don't think things politically are, are moving in any different direction uh, yeah. anytime soon. Um, to kind of, I mean, just to come back to what you were talking about, um, a lot of, a lot of the, the initial kind of starting point for a lot of these projects has been maybe a lot more defined, uh, you know, in some ways. But over a period of time for me, whether it is looking at the mannequin series, whether it's looking at Chunaraja, whether it's looking at um, you know, to a certain degree, even captive cams or, or you know, um, 
maybe even you know to a very large degree the current work that you're finalizing into a book form real diwali um they all interconnect in some ways right like i mean it's almost like looking at a singular larger body of work but that's broken down into chapters that address um different aspects of your own thought process you know in, in some ways and i think what i i mean i'm curious to know like i know trilogies is maybe something that you're fascinated by it's a format that's also come through in a lot of your works um is this something that happens as more of like a premeditated decision saying that this is a subject that i'm going to work on and these are the three different um chapters within it or is that something that ends up happening more as as a result of of arriving at these works and then finding the connections between them i think um i okay so in terms of trilogies like what what interests me is basically i come very much i wouldn't say i've i've never been a film student but my coming into the idea of like visual work has a lot to do with you know looking at films and studying film and in in a lot of my favorite directors look at the idea of conceptualizing their bodies of work as as trilogies notably lars von trier or one of my favorites roy anderson you know so and i mean they're two amongst many others who do that and i kind of feel that it's a very it's a way of categorizing your work in these sort of hyper structures if i could call them that right and to sort of explore thematics through a broader uh, exploration of like diverse things and i mean like the trilogy is a sweet spot you know like it's not it's more than that becomes painfully big probably and less than that is not enough so that's why the like the number 3 is very interesting and you know the idea of the trilogy has holds particular resonance mm -hmm. and for me like it's a, it's a framework in which so i borrow that from the idea of the filmmakers as mm -hmm. to create something in photography that lives in these in the idea as trilogies so right. i mean i'm like right now they like all of my work most of it kind of fits in these different uh, constellations of trilogies let's say and then the trilogies right. also relate to each other and yeah so like as you mentioned the captive cam so that's part of like a cyber trilogy where i was working right. with cyber sex and then i was working with google maps and then with online feeds of animals so that's the cyber cyber trilogy mm -hmm. then there is the shunaraja trilogy which is the climate change work in three different chapters and then there's the night project of which mannequin was the first part so you know like there are all these sort of uh, these trilogies that kind of also go into each other and feed but they also exist as their independent explorations of a particular thematic or an idea mm -hmm. or uh, or a space or a site as well so that's right, uh, right. so they they are they are trilogies in different ways so right. yeah and they've all had fairly unique manifestations as well right um um like i think i mean of course the mannequin has has a trilogy book format the picnic also has a book format but then we come to shunya raja which is actually uh at least our access to it right now is through an instagram handle we have uh, yeah. the dinos of hindustan which is a very interesting project that i also want to talk about which is in in many ways um, a a collective instagram handle because it is you uh you know creating this archive almost um and yet kind of doing a very tongue in cheek political commentary on what's happening or you know how you feel about what's happening in in the country um and then without maybe people consciously being aware to it they are they are feeding into that political storytelling as well uh you know uh and i mean it's been interesting with uh, with the captive cams i know that um it's it's beginning to take shape and form into more installation based works as well and and now picnic has a film that's currently underway so i mean it's i'm interested to know how these forms come into being like i mean what feeds uh, does the form come as a result of work that's already there or is it something that you do decide because that then begins to to a certain degree maybe dictate how you investigate the project as well right yeah i think uh, i mean for for a lot of the projects i would say that 
the photography is kind of the central point of departure mm-hmm. but it's never restricted to that so a lot of the time it's built up consistently over time as a photographic base let's say a template right. or a body of images that stand as as photographic works unto themselves let's say mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but then they with time they also morph into other things mm-hmm. and become into other mediums so to give an example of picnic as right. you mentioned so right now um, so we were working with uh, so i i did the book and uh, i mean i can show you guys the book as well so it's uh, really it's nice. here so this was i've been working on this project since 2014 as i mentioned so this was the book that came out mm-hmm. from picnic project it came out in 2018 it was published by le becon lab which is a, a publishing house in marseille france and um, so that's the uh, so that's basically the book it's a fairly uh, yeah it's got these images that come Sorry, let me yeah. turn I a bit. You might so, have. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So right. yeah. So uh, not to delve too much on the book, really, but uh, mm-hmm. you know, like it. Uh, so that's kind of like uh, that's some pages from the book. Right. Um, right. And uh, yeah, it's so uh, it's done in a fairly sort of. I wanted to keep the look very classy yet contemporary in the sense that all the images are like you go into the images in a way you. you go directly into the into the into the project the mm-hmm. the shape of the images are all the same in the book the format and the scale so mm-hmm. it's um, so the design element is kind of kept at a minimum but there's a lot of thought into the editing etc so well anyway so the, we made the book in 2018 mm-hmm. and then um, after the book was done i kind of i mean i kept working it was also the same year that i started working on a on a video project essentially on the picnics because right. i started realizing that a lot of the the book or the photographic work itself is more sort of a study of a socio cultural aspect mm-hmm. or phenomenon mm-hmm. and then there are things that you see in the but the, you also see people for example uh dancing like a group of uh, let's say a group of young guys mm-hmm. dancing to a song which is sort of a genocidal song saying we should you know the it's a right. techno trance remix of one of these hindutva songs fascist, which says yeah. like we should yeah it's a fascist fascist call to arms you know and then they are mm-hmm. dancing to that beat at a picnic so that's something which you cannot represent for example in a photograph but the okay. video kind of does that so that's kind of one of the things that led to the video project because the photographs rest as a socio cultural phenomenon whereas the the video work becomes more of a political project which explores the sort of the zeitgeist of the time that we are in and mm-hmm. so i've been doing that for 3 years now and then we then i got like i we created like a team with my so there's a producer now um there are two producers now and then we created like a team to sort of uh, formalize the project and now and then we applied for some grants and we've been we got one yeah uh, like this week and mm-hmm. uh, we're super excited and also like it's become more of a like now we have to do it seriously basically so yeah, <laughs> right. before i was right. doing it yeah before so so there's test. the film but also i think for me like i mean i i would think of picnic as a as a concept as an idea you know in which mm-hmm. uh, there are the photographs and then there was the book let's say or there right. is the book but there was the book and now there's a film which is which looks which departs from the photographs but becomes something else altogether mm-hmm. and from a lot of this also i'm working with the idea of making installations essentially sculptural installations so mm-hmm. that's a new medium for me and uh, it's a uh, and so th- this after i came back to india uh, and you know i've been at home so i've been sort of designing these uh, these very uh, elaborate installation possibilities which of course i haven't started working on them in right. their thought experiments in a sense but right. uh they've been in my mind for like 5 6 years but it's right now because of the pandemic and the fact that you know you're mm-hmm. you can't move around much so the pho- the photographic practice is also kind of jumping into all these different positions and directions because of the fact that photography is kind of stuck in a way you know during the right pandemic so yeah right um just to go back uh to picnic and you know a couple of things from it is i mean one is of course the whole the whole act of of producing it into a book form 
Um, yeah. And I mean, I was curious to know how, I, I, I think Picnic is the first, first book that you've also worked on. Would I be yeah. right saying that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I, I was curious to know um, why you felt that the book would be a, a good format for, for the still images. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll throw two, three questions at you and <laughs> you can kind okay. of, yeah. Yeah. you know. So I think one thing was obviously to know about like, what do you think the book did for, for that work? And also in that dynamic, I mean, your choice to find find a collaborator to find a publisher who was based outside of India what you know like what kind of decisions what kind of reasons affected these decisions um, and it would be really nice if you can also share some aspects of what it was like to take um, to take your work to a publisher and have them respond to it because um, I mean I know that there are not many interventions that have been made in the in this particular book let's say uh, from the point of view of design, it's kind of very classic, very clean, very simple. And the focus is more on the edit and how you begin to read, yeah. read that story, you know, in some ways and how you begin to read layers into each image, because I mean, although the moments are kind of very, can be neutral, but if you actually yeah. begin to investigate and go back and forth through the sequencing, you begin to kind of question more and more of what you're seeing. Um, so yeah, I think let's start with these and then I'll, <laughs> I'll well, that's, send that's you a lot some of questions, more. But I'll, yeah, right. yeah. I, think, I think what I do, like when I work with projects, because they are these very long-term projects which I'm doing by myself. And I mean, the idea of the book is kind of very much ingrained in the, the projects themselves. So every right. project that I do has like a book component inbuilt into the way I conceive of the projects, let's say. Okay. Uh, or they gradually come to be, you know, so, and I'm, I mean, because and, they are my own projects. So, yeah. No, I was just going to say, why is that? I mean, it's, I think, I mean, I like the book, basically. I, right. I mean, there's, that's, I would say that's the, yeah, I, li I like the idea of having a book. It's, it's pretty cool. Right. And um, I mean, that's, that's reason good enough for me, that's, but also, that's yeah, good I mean, enough reason, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's, yeah. I mean, uh, for me, like, uh, 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 like all the, all the projects that I do are things that I want to do and there's nobody's forced me to do them or, you know, so everything right. is because I, and I mean, a lot of them are very weird things. Like there wouldn't be photography projects. Mm -hmm. Like they, I kind of make them, you know, in a sense, like they right. become photography projects because I kind of put them together and they, like you define them in a way. Right. Uh, and um, a lot of them are very random, very disparate things. But they have the, I mean, because it's a, like you mentioned the idea of the long-term project. So one thing about, one very essential thing about a long-term project is you keep working with the edits every time. So it's kind of like distillation, you know? So you're mm -hmm. constantly, I come back, I add some more images, but then I go back to the edit and then I change and shuffle things around, you know? So you do right. that over like five or six years and then you kind of get into this idea of like placing your work together. So... Uh, for the longest time. So that logic kind of stayed in the work, you know? Right. Uh, and so that's what happened. So, but uh, interesting thing is, uh, while I was working on the picnic project, I was actually working on two books together. So okay. Mannequin was also a book and Picnic and Mannequin kind of came out together, like in a space of two or three months, but mm -hmm. they came out together. I mean, they came out in 2018. Um, right. and, uh, one came out in all, so picnic came out right. in all, mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, the mannequin book came out at unseen Amsterdam. So they were, I mean, right. it was all like very new for me. It, I was on, like, I came back with a lot of understanding about how these festivals work and what's mm -hmm. going on. And, you know, like, yeah. um, it's, uh, but, uh, I can show you the mannequin book. So you'll get, that would be how, really amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, actually, so, if we could even see some images from picnic and before we move to mannequin i also wanted to talk about like i mean how books seem yeah. to have become a final form you know in so many ways yeah yeah, yeah um yeah. you know like you 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 invest your yourself your time um your questions everything is kind of directed into this one project you take your own time and the book is supposed to well not supposed to but i guess in the larger reading one assumes that once you make a book it is 
it is the final closure of your engagement with that work, you know, um, and it's something that I'm also trying to question at the same time. I, I don't think I necessarily agree with, with that finality, but in your particular case, and specifically because we are, you know, just discussing picnic right now, um, there yeah. is no, I mean, that finality does not exist as such, right? Um, we just saw a really beautiful image and it'd be really nice if you can share that uh, with yeah, us yeah, I'll you know, do that. as well. So, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I'll share them and then... I'll and then uh, yeah, as, and then I'd like to move to Mannequin as well. Sure, sure, let's do that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's... I hope they're... Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll let this image stay and... Um, um, sorry, so I think... Can you see it? No. It's, I think the screen, is the screen is sharing, yeah. Oh, okay. You check once. Do you want me to do it again? Uh, yes, please. Okay, yeah, this is good. You can see it? For some very odd reason, I can't, but I'm getting messages from our attendees okay. saying they can. <laughs> okay, I think you're connected, yeah. Yeah, okay, I think so, there's something um, up with the connection, but I think, uh, yeah, you can talk about it. So, uh, well, yeah, so for me, like, as again, going back to the idea of the long-term project, for me, like, mm -hmm a project is more, the project continues. They, I, I mean, I think of them as like children, you know, so, mm -hmm. I mean, not that I have children, but like the projects are the but closest that I have. So, I mean, you, you, so once you like let them be, they start becoming these things. I mean, they are a long-term, mm -hmm. a, a long-term endeavor, let's say. So, you know, like they keep going. So they start off as a photography project and at some point you make a book. But for me, it's never stopped there. I mean, I've been, as I was saying, with Picnic, I've been working on a film project. And now there's like these installations and hopefully right. some years down the line, it will all come together in like a proper exhibition, looking at all these aspects. And that's when the Picnic project would kind of reach its fruition, let's say. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, this image that you can see right now is, for example, an image that I found and I took, it's one of my favorite images. I've not shared it before. So it's kind of one of the first times that I wanted to share it here with you guys here. Thank you. So uh, it's a very magical sort of image for me. It's very special. Um, and it kind of, it's, a, it's very different from the work that you have in the book, which is mostly daytime images. Right. And now I'm exploring more the idea of the picnic at night, mm -hmm. but also the idea of picnic as a religious phenomenon, picnic as a political phenomenon. So, you know, it's expanding the scope of what a picnic could be mm -hmm. so it's becoming you know so this is one image which looks at that it's a it's a boat which is waiting for the tides to come in so it's kind of stranded in this very desolate landscape but very magical and surreal and these people are waiting and then right. once the tides came in is this is what uh, that's the second image that you can see here mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> this is also like one of my I think I mean these are some of the best images that I have taken till now and they're super right. special I to mean, me these I don't are... why, but I was you know? stunned when I even, I mean, I just saw yeah. it a couple of minutes ago, but they're hauntingly beautiful. I have to, I Thank have you. to say, and it's just. And I mean, for me, like they kind of uh, coalesce a lot of things. Like this is when the tides actually came in and then this boat is very much, uh, it's in a very fragile spot where it's been rocked mm. by this, the waves that came in. That's why they're kind of teetering and you know, they mm. seem like they would capsize very soon, but they didn't. So mm -hmm. it's kind of the reality of the Delta where I, I mean, the Bengal Delta, it's very much fraught as an environmental zone, but you have these people still trying to have a good time, you know, so it kind of, uh, it brings together a lot of things. So, yeah, so that's, um, uh, and so the, the photographs, I mean, I'm, I'm still working on the photographs, even though the photographic book has been, you know, it's, there right. is a far. It out. So, I mean, it's all in constant development. It's in constant flux. And that's how I see photography and that's how I see my projects. And, you know, like, I mm -hmm. think, um, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of where, okay, I'm stopping the screen. So okay. that's kind of where, um, yeah, that's where I see me as a, as an artist, as a, as a, as a process oriented artist, let's say, right. moving from one to the other and sort of finding, yeah. Right. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, I had, um, unfortunately, I'm in the hills and I had a slight disconnection, but I caught up in time where you were showing in your second image when the 
river, you know, when the boat comes back in to the river. And yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, one of the things yeah. is, you know, it's, it's interesting to also see this because in some ways, I think with, with the work that's in the book already, there is a very defined visual aesthetic that even holds the work together. You know, uh, it's not just daytime, but it's also, you know, a certain kind of composition, a certain kind of visual conversation that's going on there, uh, a particular visual yeah, aesthetic. Yeah. And, and these images, which is, of course, a very, very small peek into what else is going on, you know, uh, with, with Picnic, uh, in many ways is a, is, a, is a departure from that aesthetic as well, uh, you know. And it would be interesting to see how they come together. If they even come together, do they become another trilogy? Maybe, I, I don't know. Is that something that, that you've thought about right now? Or is that something that, uh, I mean, I'm just kind of coming back to form from, from you know. Yeah, yeah. So two things there. One is, um, yeah, I mean, I work on like my, each, each project that I work on because I work on them as long-term engagements. They develop their own very specific visual style. So I'm not, I'm not in like inherently um, uh, loyal to one particular thing. So I'm working mm -hmm. in different projects with flash photography. The others I work in a very classical sort of way with, you know, or like picnic is like in a four by five sort of format or, you know, so, uh, or like with rail Diwali, which is long yeah. exposure at night. And I'm working with my new climate change project. I'm working with infrared photography, which is really like large format, photography which is super slow like each image takes 30 minutes to you know so um right. create because it's very delicate and you have to calibrate a lot of things so i mean it's a it's a mixture i mean i use there's a multiplicity of like form and visual form and visual languages that i'm developing mm -hmm. simultaneously but they each tell like they push that particular project forward so that's how i see them so right. uh, they come with a particular reasoning that makes sense for that project so um so yeah and i mean in in terms of trilogy like picnic i'm already seeing as a it's picnic is a, now become a trilogy of form so there is the photography project right. then there's the film project and then there's the now installation the work so you know so it's it's become a trilogy of form as opposed mm -hmm. to the other ones which are trilogies of photography let's say so, right right yeah right. And I mean, similarly, I, I have mean, a lot of time to think about this. It's pandemic time <laughs> sitting at home. So, yeah. Right. That sounds, that sounds really yeah. good. Yeah. We can keep talking about this for a while yeah, as yeah, well, sure. you know. Um, I know we're almost hitting half an hour and I just wanted to kind of um, give a little thing saying in another um, about 15, 20 maybe because I have more questions as we get further into this conversation. We'll open out to questions. So, um, uh, there is the chat section, but there's also the Q&A section. So just drop in your questions there and then we'll be able to pick it up from there. Uh, moving from Picnic, which, um, which also kind of was in many ways initiated out of your own childhood memories, right? Like this was a spot that you went to as, as a child yourself with your family. Um, you grew up and started kind of reading newspaper articles about things that maybe you were also part of that experience, but suddenly you realize the dynamics of that experience. And, and that kind of, you know, brings up different questions. Um, the mannequin work in many ways, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the initiator for that, for that was 2014, right? Like the initiator for that was the emergence of, well, not the emergence, I guess, but the establishment of this fascist power that comes into place. And, and kind of looking at, at the night timeline as, as metaphorically maybe, you know, into that hidden sense of violence that suddenly the country was also being obsessed with, you know, like kind of like if I'm, I think that's how I, I mean, that's how I read it. And I think that's where it kind of started from. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, interesting to see what kind of triggers you off in many ways, because a lot of these projects are also happening parallelly, right? Like, um, yeah, yeah. you know, a picnic in many ways feeds into a different project and starts something over there, which feeds into a different idea and starts a new investigation. And I mean, I'm curious to know how these manifestations occur. And like, maybe we can discuss that specifically with regards to the mannequin work. 
I think I think what's uh, so I think that's a that's a rationalization that came a bit later. Like when I started off in 2014, I didn't think like we I didn't know that the country is going to become this, right? Yeah, no, so, I mean, no one had we, anticipated we, we, this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we we feared, but then it's all coming true. So I mean, mm -hmm. so the 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 conceptualization and the understanding of what that project is also developed as and when I did the project. So I mean. Yeah, so like to give an example, so that's one thing, for example, uh, to give examples like, uh, for example, in the book, like mm -hmm. we, we can talk about the book, but on the book, whatever, like there's this cover, which is this images of a pregnant goat, right? And uh, it's, it's mixed, like it's a very complex cover, but uh, what you see as the base image here is this pregnant goat. Mm -hmm. And uh, very uncanny, but the day the book was printed in 2018 was also the same day that this very bizarre news came out of this pregnant goat being um, uh, physically assaulted by four people in, in, in the periphery of Delhi. So, you know, like, right. the, so the, I mean, there are these sort of weird parallels that I was not aiming for, but they ended up becoming the, bec becoming the truth that the project started carrying with it, you know? So mm -hmm. it's not, uh, so that's, I mean, that's a good way of saying like that the project kind of carried the truth of the time as opposed to like me saying like this is how this is it yeah this is or I started off from there I didn't actually start off from there um, I was working out of all the projects that I do I have this one project which is kind of like a mother project I would call it which right. is on the river Ganga and I've been doing that for like since ever and uh, it's become this humongous project right now with my climate change project being part of it and like it's a mess like it's a I can't even make an edit right now because there's so many things in it, right? But what happened is like when I was doing that project, I also started working in, along the Gangetic, like let's say the cow belt essentially. So mm -hmm. I was working a lot in Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, West Bengal. So in that right. entire Gangetic plain, which is kind of where the sort of the big struggles of Hindutva play out. And the right? establishment so, of Hindutva. Yeah, the, essentially. The emergence yeah, yeah. of it is essentially that. Yeah, that. yeah and the bastion, let's say. So, mm -hmm. and so a lot of that work I was doing at night when I was not thinking of that. I mean, I started doing that work as a reaction to more sort of constructivist projects. I was doing a project which was bereft of meaning. I wanted to go out at night and explore in a free way, but mm -hmm. because it was, I mean, there was a specific visual language that I developed and it was done in a very specific way. But the meaning kind of started coming in because I let the, the, uh, the, the space was empty. So a lot of these meanings kind of started coming into the project with time, you know. So this is okay. like that image is one, for example, or an image of like a broken truck on a highway, which kind of I'm very, I'm very inspired and like very drawn to trucks, like the small mm -hmm. matador, mini matador kind of trucks. Mm -hmm. And these are the trucks that became emblematic because of, you know, like the lynchings that happened and of people uh, of the of Muslims and Dalits on suspicion of being cow smugglers like and right. they were lynched and you had these high incidents a spate of these incidents so images like that which were not taken because of this but they become representative and emblematic of um, that zeitgeist let's say so mm -hmm. that's how that project was built it's a very free flowing sort of uh, yeah and so that's one thing also uh, sorry yeah I mean Geographically also, I mean, at least initially, there was um, an entire section of this, I mean, which was probably the starting point, which was not even based um, in India, uh, you know, if, if uh, we want to get to the work that you'd shown in Penang at Obscura as well. Uh, yeah, so that's part of like, I mean, that's part of the night, like I, I kind of, my, my work, I kind of focus around India, plus the Bengal Delta, which is, a lot of it is Bangladesh. So I work, I've been in the last three, four years, I spend a lot of time in Bangladesh uh, and I love it. And then also like the extended Bengal Delta, you know, like in the colonial time, Penang and Singapore were administered from the Bengal presidency. So, right. I, I mean, you don't see those connections right now, but there are a lot of people living in those places which who were products of like migration flows. So, Mm -hmm. The second part in that, uh, the Night Trilogy is a project that is done in Penang and mm -hmm. in the sort of Malaysian sort of archipelago, let's say. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that Snake Fire, which was supposed to come out as a book this year, but with a pandemic, etc. It was actually supposed to come out three days back. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, well, you got a grant the, instead. So <laughs> that's a good balance. Yeah, the, I mean, it's true. It came out on the same day, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was... 
but uh, yeah, there was a big plan with the book, etc. But that's all. I mean, that's not happening right now. So we'll see right. when it happens. But uh, right. uh, but also, like interestingly, like just to seg a bit mm -hmm. back, like this image, for example, on the picnic book is very interesting because it's a it's a space which is on the Ganga River, mm -hmm. and what you see here is a Portuguese pirate fort from like the 1600s which has been there and now it's breaking apart because of the way the waters have been coming. So let's say climate change, but also because a lot of ships come and the waves are breaking it down. So there's, and the effect of tides and the monsoon. So like, there's a lot of reasons why this is breaking down. So this is a space which I work, like the same particular spot I work for my climate change work, for my river work, and for my picnic work where you see these, uh, so this, this building is breaking, the, the ramparts, the ruins of the sport are breaking down. And you have these policemen who are sitting on top of it. Hmm. But at the same time, they're sitting there to prevent picnickers from coming and sitting on top of it, which would break down the structure. So, you know, like that's, yeah. and that's how like the police or administration works. Yeah. yeah. So the, the image kind of tells you what India is, you know. So, yeah. but, so just to give you an example of like in the long-term projects, like there is a multiplicity of form and ways in which the same spot or the same site becomes a point of departure for these multiple projects, let's say. So, right, yeah. Right. And I mean, I'm also curious because, of course, these are works that you kind of get invested in politically yeah, as well, yeah. right? Like, um, has it been, and because it's not a particular community, but like the spaces that you do engage with, let's say, not necessarily the people because they're more fluid, uh, you know, in many ways to, to the region. I think your um, the focus is more on the geographies of it. Um, has, I mean, do you think at some point uh, you'd like these to also become conversations within those geographies through what you're creating? Like, is that maybe another medium? Like, conversations know, with who? Sorry. With people who are in those regions. Let's say, so if it is the Sundarbans that you're working with, or if it is um, you know, certain kind of policies that you are addressing. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's the hope. That's, of course, the hope. Like, uh, at least with the climate change work, I really want, like, I mean, part of my idea is to take, like, a, have a boat with these images and that goes from India to Bangladesh and, like, does, goes mm -hmm. to these places and, like, tells the stories of the Bangladeshi side to the Indian side and from okay. the Indian side to the Bangladeshi side to sort of bring, uh, to mm -hmm. sort of make a sense of Bon Homi and Kamadri, which does not exist anymore because the land right. which was a very tightly knit space has been fractured because of the partition and right now on the indian side you have like it's um it's primarily hindu while the bangladeshi side is predominantly muslim you know so that like on top of climate change there are these layers of religion and how society functions as a function of religion and like all of that become part of these narratives it's not like climate change is one of the overriding aspects but there right. are multiple other things that I explore through them, so. Right, right. And yeah. I mean, I was, I was kind of also getting to that because maybe in some ways and from here, I, you know, just kind of also want to move into de uh, Dinos of Hindustan, uh, where yeah. I feel like you are addressing and you are in many ways maybe even facilitating a conversation. And it is an act of publishing, although we have different, different views on that maybe slightly. But I feel like, you know, even to have that Instagram handle becomes an act of publishing. And the minute you kind of have it out in a domain, which is more interactive, you kind of allow the conversations from that also to emerge and, uh, you know, fuel the work, but at least hopefully offer some kind of a trigger into, uh, you know, what people are thinking or how they are looking at something. And I mean, it's very interesting because I think, the symbolism that you are using in Dinos of Hindustan allows for people to not create these barriers when they're viewing the work. You know, invariably when we are looking at or trying to have a conversation about extremely political subjects, um, how we approach it changes everything in terms of engagement, right? And you've kind of taken something that people are curious about, people want to participate in it at the same time. And then before they know it, they're kind of in the depths of, of reading these different layers that's going on, on a largely yeah. interactive format. So if you could, uh, I mean, if you can talk a little bit about Dinosaur of Hindustan, how that came about and 
how that's continuing, you know, like how it's become kind of almost a collaborative medium in many ways. Oh, that would be really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things to say about that project. It's, I mean, it's also in, in like very strong expanse, like it's expanding every day and I'm coming out with new stories, etc. But it's to say like, it's my first project, which is in a sense, like I I'm writing. So there's a lot more writing involved. And that's kind of one of the directions that I've been going in the last two years where last two, three years where, and it's, uh, and the writing incorporates like, I mean, there's a very strong political side, but it's very densely packed with references to the right wing ecosystem, the political mm -hmm. spectrum, but also science, also like uh, postmodern warfare, let's say. So like the, there's that, the science fiction, there's history, like it just brings in, or I mean, I mean, I intend to, I don't know if I'm succeeding, but like I'm trying to bring in and like wow. densely pack them with, you know, like mul a multitude of a multiplicity of things. But uh, um, the project itself, I'm, I, with different projects, I try to engage the way the projects are created themselves. So dinosaurs mm -hmm. of dinosaurs of Hindustan is in a sense, uh, uh, it's a, it's, I, I would call it a crowdfunded project really. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. when we talk about crowdfunded projects, we're always thinking of like somebody financing the book or a journey with mm -hmm. money, like, you know, the crowdfunding yeah. always has a financial aspect. I wanted to see how we could create a project which is crowdfunded in terms of the material for the project so mm -hmm. so that's why the project i've been sharing since the beginning i've been sharing the images very widely and very freely you know so right. on facebook initially and then i created the instagram so there so so there is sort of a people are following the project and then right now i mean whenever there's like a dinosaur anywhere people will let me know you know like one dino yeah. new dinosaur has appeared so you know and it's very difficult to do that by yourself it's impossible so a right. lot of the new dinosaur, a lot of the, most of the work has been done because people gave me, you know, uh, told me where I could find something and how to get there. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, now I'm, I mean, people send me images from all over the world where I have right. to tell them like, you know, like this, I'm doing this only in like India, like they're subcontinental Anthropocene dinosaurs, essentially to be right. Right. very specific, but um, to go to the idea of the project, uh, I think it came out from the mannequin project and my sort of long standing exploration of looking at the night and doing flash imagery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and then in all my projects, like it was actually kind of at one exhibition where I was kind of joking with my, the audience, uh, where I was telling them that in all my projects I have, I need to have one dinosaur image and they are okay. there actually. Right. And then out of that, like I started thinking like, Hey, what's, what is drawing me to them? And then, mm -hmm. And then sort of from that, the dinosaurs became like a separate project unto itself. Right. And then I started, you know, building up on it and then started writing in sort of bringing in the creative writing aspect to it. And uh, I created the, what I call the Institute for Contemporary Dinosaur Studies, which is a reference to the, the quack research institutes that are coming up with a research in Gaumutra and, you know, all of that. So right. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an analogy to that, to the, to the, to the small research institutes that are propping up all over India and how they are running their research. And also like, so that's one aspect. And so there is a photographer, there's a documentarian or an archivist, Vishnu Gopal Datta, that's what right. called. And he goes out and takes images of these dinosaurs. And there is Dr. Partha Sharati, who's sort of the academic, who runs the institute. So they together collate and archive and publish things. And they talk about fake news and like they, they debunk myths and all the, but they are debunking and making like other <laughs> fake news. So, you know, like, yes. but there's also like a lot of memes, there's fake tweets, there's fake WhatsApp. So it's like, mm -hmm. it brings in like a diverse, um, so it's a commentary basically on image generation in today's world and how sort of social media disseminates truth and non-truth. Right. And uh, so it, it, and I mean, it is the most political sort of, and also of I'm, your I'm, works, I think, yeah, yeah most, it is. most outwardly it is. political. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, like, I mean, what's very interesting and what I really want to explore is the, like in photography, the problem is, or, I mean, not the problem, but I feel that, I mean, you, if you could go to a protest or a, or a, you know, a movement and take images of that, which become mm -hmm. documents of the political mm -hmm. event, but they are not political in themselves. So right. I mean, a big question that I've been grappling with is, how to create political work with photography, you know, whether the work itself is political in a sense. And that's where right. I've been going more and more. Um, right. And so the dinosaur dinosaurs of Hindustan is one of the most sort of where all of that is pushed to its sort of right. uh, 
I mean, I'm also curious to know, have people, have people engaged with you in a political conversation through Diners of Hindustan? I mean, so there's something that needs to be said is, which is a big problem. I mean, they are very well um, covered. So, Concealed, yeah. Intensely. Yeah, yeah. So that's there. I yeah. mean, so, but also like the problem with social media is like you're preaching to the preach. So like the, the people that see my work are people that would share my views. So, mm -hmm. you know, like we are in these sort of spectral, but I mean, sometimes you get, I mean, I get, I get, I get angry messages and stuff. Yeah, but uh, but uh, not not too much, and I kind of try to keep it under the radar. I'm not trying to make it a big mm -hmm. thing. So it's very it's kept you know it's in a manageable space. So um, okay. yeah, I mean that's that's kind of I mean. I mean, how does one thing. bridge that though, or, or or do you want to bridge that? Uh, I mean, I'm still building it up, right? So right. I don't want to I don't want to create unnecessary attention to it. I want to keep it strong in terms of mm -hmm. like the thought and the writing and, and the political intent of the work, but not right. to, but I don't want to push it by myself and see where it goes. I mean, I'm doing my bit to create the work and, you know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I mean, I don't see myself really as an activist. I, I'm, right. I'm, I'm an artist who is doing work, which is very political or yeah. intense. But that's in response to your own kind of question. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, I'm like, trying to, these are, I mean, I'm seeing all this injustice mm -hmm. and shit going everywhere. So like, it's a response to that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's more vociferous or vocal in certain projects than right. other ones. But there's right. also like, for example, the Panopticams, which is just images of CCTVs, but right. just looking at the architecture of surveillance in the country right now. Mm -hmm. And as a, and I mean, I had this, right? Like th when I made the project, the first, the, I had this one line description for this Panopticam project. And it said like, uh, till the time when the government comes for the dissidents, you know, and that's actually happening today, you know, and right. I mean, in the last three, uh, in the last three weeks, like you've been seeing people charged, cheated in such a crazy way, right? So um, that's actually, so the, the, the one statement that I had for Panopticams is actually becoming very sadly true in a very scary way right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been happening, but... Uh, yeah, but I think so, like yeah. the, the intensity of that and the brazenness yeah, yeah. of that more than yeah, anything yeah. else. I think that's what's shocked most of us because we would have these conversations and say this yeah, is something yeah. that's possible. Yeah. Uh, and then you realize it's not just possible, it's happened. But it's happened with this almost sense of ownership to yeah, the yeah. fascist methodology, you know, to say that this is what we were always here for, you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah, what else exactly. were you expecting in some ways. And so, so with the dinos work, like you, I mean, you see the writing and the, and the yeah. images and which is going to become a book, like in, in a year or year and a half, I would say. And the book is going to, I mean, I'm very interested in the form that that book would take because right. I want it to be at the same time, a book that like very, like five-year-olds would see and be like, Oh, this is a great book of like dinosaurs. Right. And they would be happy seeing that, right. but at the same time, it would have these writings and somebody who is more invested in the, in the other aspects of the book would draw entirely different sort of readings from that from book. It. So in right. terms of the book that is, I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, my idea would be the, the little, the, 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 the little prints would be, you know, like how right. different people at different ages would sort of take away. So mm -hmm. that becomes a very strong design uh, element that I've been researching for the last Two years uh, right. and trying to find Which that form, that form. Right, and that's a shift in how I mean, how you did want your first book to remain classical. You wanted it to kind of remain very, very clean, very simple. And Mannequin, of course, had a had a larger design collaborative element to it, where yeah, images yeah. were cropped into design was laid over it. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, there was a there was con almost like this. We broke this down the in image, your yeah. face chaos that that yeah. you uh, you know you have to address as you turn the pages, um, and uh, you know I'm I know that you're working on Rail Diwali. It's not a work that's complete. Uh, it's not uh, a project that you have finished designing. But it would be really nice if you can share a little bit about that because um, I, yeah I think we'll end with that. But I do want to talk about that uh, you know before we move to some questions. Uh, about Rail Diwali? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's a project I've been doing for six years now. I think the project itself is finished in terms of like the images. I've, right. it's, uh, and I've, I've made the final edit of like the images. Now I'm thinking of the form of the book, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want it to be very 
like I'm really interested in the idea of the materiality of what the book should be like, you know, so mm -hmm. it's a, like, um, I mean, for example, like I want to explore the idea of uh, uh, when, you know, when we have these uh, puljaris, the firecrackers in India, yeah. like the Siva Kasi fireworks thing, when you're using like a, one of the puljaris. Actually, I, I don't know. know. Yeah, I don't know what the, what the... But when you use them, like you have this silvery sheen on your hands, right? Like you, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a very material aspect to the fire, firecrackers that we have in India. I mean, right. now a lot of them are banned, but when back in the day, like the good old days, like, I mean, not the good, but you know, like your hands <laughs> I mean, would be banned, but they're not really banned. Yeah. Is, so in know. the in the book, I want to create that. I mean, I'm building that texture into the work. So you know, right. like it it becomes more than like the images or whatever. Like it has to like the book needs to sort of con to convey that feeling of having these firecrackers sort of come at you. You know, like I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's how when I was doing this project. Along the rail tracks of the suburban Could we rail see tracks. some images of that? Uh, I need to find them, but why oh, not? Okay. No, no, I can uh, give me a... I think uh, they're on the drive. Do you want me to open that selection uh, now? I mean, I can, I, can, I can show some, yeah. Don't worry. That would be great. Uh, yeah, so I've been... And when, you're, when I've been working on that project, like you have these sort of fireworks flying at you like these rockets and like crazy shit like coming at you so you right. know, uh, uh, yeah um, and I mean it's a project which is uh, which looks at the like this image for example can you see the screen yeah so this is one of the earliest images where you have these firecrackers like that's what I was saying like you have these firecrackers kind of you're being attacked by them you know so right. uh, while it's also very dangerous because like the trains are also coming and going and I mean sometimes I came very very dangerously close to the trains, which is not mm. a very good idea. But the people are always telling you to be careful, and it's right. an important thing. They've but got an uh, eye out for you. Yeah, but I, I, you see this building on the left, on the right. So that mm. building is this super luxurious complex that was being built uh, mm. from the beginning of the project, and kind of becomes this sort of silent actor in the project, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. six years down the line, again to come back to the idea of a long-term project, like when yeah. I started off this project these are the images i found there was the skeletal structure of the project of this building you know right. um, and, and then uh, during across the course of this long-term project like this is how the building ended up being you know so and mm. uh, it ended up being this very finished structure whereas oh. the the lives of the people around them in the slums and the localities below has still stayed the same so you know that becomes part of the uh, this is another image from the top of that building where I got access to, you know, so you see though, this is the last year. So across right. the span of these six years, like this, so the building becomes a kind of a silent actor in the project. And mm -hmm. I mean, Rail Diwali is at one point a very architectural project right. and it explores the architecture of the city. So uh, that's where, uh, so these are some images and I mean, I can mm -hmm. show you some more. Uh, yeah, that'd be nice. Maybe you could ones. just... Um... Yeah, just do like a slideshow-ish. I mean, there, there, there's like a huge number of them. Oh, but okay. I think, uh, Maybe yeah. out of... But like this one thing. is one of my favorite ones, you know, like which, uh, mm. which has this person perched under this bridge and he's actually built like a two-story house. Uh, right. Whereas this is land which, is, uh, which, is not, which does not belong to him, but he has mm -hmm. developed a sense of propriety, let's say. I mean, the project become like very recently again in September with like in Delhi, you know, like with the Supreme Court Justice Mishra, the last ruling that yeah. he gave before leaving was that we have to evict these thousands of dwellers along the rail tracks. And like mm -hmm. you get to know how, how fragile, how fraught the life of people along these rail tracks are. So, uh, I mean, though this project is done in Calcutta, this, evict this idea of eviction is something very, uh, very strongly. I mean, they face at the same time. Right. Um, and these are two other images that could be very interesting is this kid like what you see in this image is mm -hmm. uh, it's a very gory image of like this kid sitting and he's sort of pulling on this installation which is a crematorium yeah right along the rail tracks and then the one beside that was this one which is a hospital which is an ambulance and then you have a dead body inside it and I was like what's going on so and damn absurd I mean wh where are these installations coming from? So oh, I asked the guy, so this, this, these kids that live in the locality just behind, 
mm-hmm. they made these uh, they made these installations and i asked them they were like you know like we live in this space where people are constantly losing a limb or having a sm- even more serious accident because of the trains and our life is very fraught in that sense right. so we wanted we got a chance to we do not get a, we do not have a voice but during this uh, diwali kali pujo time we got a chance to explore our frustrations through a creative outlet and this is what we did so they created this diptych very cinematic and uh, actually this was the third year in the project and this was the time when i really found my raison d'etre for the project like the first two mm-hmm. years i was doing it because i had an intuition and i was building but this was when i really found out why i should do the project pretty okay. much midway down the project you know so mm-hmm. that's why like that's that's what a long term project in a sense also does to you you find at times you find the reason quite Absolutely. when you're in the midst of it right yeah you're in the middle of it like even mm-hmm. so i i mean i kind of go on with them and then after a point sort of they become so i'll stop there on the screen for that yes, that. yes. uh we've hit 7 pm which is our official cut off time okay. but there yeah. are i think a few questions and god i really i really have a whole bunch of other questions now to ask you but maybe we'll have to do a follow up goof to go to this one yeah, yeah. Uh, and and probably get into more um so we have um yeah um this is an anonymous attendee but they wanted you to talk about the dino project particularly as a metaphor um is there anything else that you might want to add to uh, yeah i think i mean the the dinosaur like the dinosaurs come like in the project like they are they i look at them as like a like the dinosaurs like the the backdrop of the project is the dinosaurs have come into earth in their second coming let's say so the first one they went extinct and like it was and suddenly they find themselves back on earth and mm-hmm. and they find themselves in the presence of human beings and they have no clue what's going on you know so right. and human beings also on the other hand do not know what's going on so so there are there are these sort of tensions between the dinosaur as the other and then mm-hmm. human beings and Yeah. and most of the a lot of the times there are these hostilities and like things happen they are killed they are lynched mm-hmm. or whatever and then at times like they also become part of the community and like so there are so the dinosaur is a very fluid metaphor for the current times i would say right. and, right. uh it and i mean as as happens in india right now like um, you could be from any of the minorities that are being attacked on a continual basis in the government but even people from majoritarian tendencies are also getting you know attacked yeah, by absolutely. very strong economic policies or you know other bills whatever so nobody is safe so everybody is like you're vacillating between being attacker and attack so that i mean there is a very fluid form to what the dinosaur mm-hmm. is but that's pushed across like different through the project in different ways yeah right yeah. um i'm just going to move to sayanthani's uh, question who wanted to know um how do you decide to keep a project in desaturate or flash mode i think it's more an aesthetic uh, kind yeah of i think i mean i develop project i develop different projects in different ways i kind of for me like what's very important is to not be in the middle so i right. think that's that's really like my so Don't they have to be either balance ground just go yeah to. i mean they have to be drained of color and like i mean mm-hmm. there is a reasoning for that but otherwise they need to be very saturated and like become a hyper real sort of world one reason is the politics like thinking about the politics of color like there is a very very fixed way in which color has been used to represent the incredible india india you know all of mm-hmm. that so yeah these uh, without yeah without into... without having a critical gaze of how you can use color to create different worlds Mm-hmm. um so uh, so the hyper saturation i used to create hyper real worlds which is kind of what india is for me but then i push it a bit more to create like surreal sort of world scapes mm-hmm. so each project creates its own very disparate universe i would say so it takes from real things but then right creates it all its own sort of self contained self referential world and through through the years they become uh that universe unto themselves Mm-hmm. and the desaturation like i work for example with picnic during winter when the light is very soft right. and i start from that but then i push it a bit more to create a more otherworldly sort of mm-hmm. so that's i mean that's how i would say it in a gist right say. i think this also maybe to a certain degree uh, addresses her follow up question which is is it purely instinct to keep different styles in different projects 
um, anything that's yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, I kind of resist the idea of like being identified by style or by a particular visual uh, language. I kind of resist that. I, I feel that that's a very art market perspective and I have nothing to do with that. Like, I mean, I don't want to be straight jacketed or something. I want my audience or I want people who are seeing my work to be very surprised every time they see something. And that's, that's my challenge for me. So uh, I want to constantly sort of innovate and find form and, you know, and I mean, of course, the, the projects also meet, like they, they the way I represent holding, them makes, I mean, it's more akin to the, the way, like what we call conceptual artists, like every project they do has its own concept and one right. is very different from the other. It's not mm -hmm. them bringing their very strong one vision and, you know, dropping it on everything. So that's right. how I really, I, that's how I really think of my, my work as well. So each project comes with its own challenges and then and I adapt accordingly. And with time you get to like, because it's a long-term project, you get to refine that over time across five, six years or even more. And then it mm -hmm. becomes something, you get time to flesh it out to make it proper. So right. that's always there, yeah. Right. Uh, we have um, another question by an anonymous attendee who wanted to know, do you think it's the visuals or the stories that define the so-called style of an artist? Yeah, so I mean, just coming back to what we yeah. were talking before, you know, so I mean, mm -hmm. I, I kind of resist the idea of like, style, like, I don't, yeah. uh, I mean, and also like, there's a very strong risk that you can become a prisoner of one style. And then oh, you yeah, stop innovating. Yeah. And I mean, there are many examples of that in photography, specifically, let's say, Absolutely. to not, I mean, not to get into names, but like, right. it's, a, it's a big risk uh, that you can have. Uh, and, uh, and I mean, I, I've sort of made a point and, and I'm, I've never identified with that at any point of my time. So, um, right. yeah, yeah. So I would really hate it if people say like, this is your, or like this, I mean, they, they should be surprised at every point. I think that's a very, right. uh, I mean, yeah. that's something I think we spoke about very briefly, you know, when we were having a previous conversation as well about how you are extremely conscious that every single work has to have like a different reference point altogether, you know, uh, visually speaking, or even in terms of, I mean, your central subject might be similar, but the approaches or the perspectives change or the visual aesthetics changes or, uh, well, in many cases, the medium itself changes, you know, whether you're talking about photo book or you're talking about installation or you're talking about film or you're talking about taking a boat down the river, you know, with, with images on it. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, in that sense, there is a very conscious decision, in fact, to keep away from, from that idea of this style or this language defines this artist. Um, but at the same time, it is, it does tend to happen, right? Like for, for photographers, let's say, sometimes who might have similar intentions, even um, if there's one body of work that, that finds, yeah, totally you know, more prominence. Um, it can often become something that becomes very difficult even for the photographer themselves to move away from because suddenly every expectation from, from an audience or a viewership demands that you kind of continue with that aesthetic. And I mean, it happens in literature. It happened to like Arundhati Roy even, you know, when, when she yeah. tried it, you know, and it's a trap. I, I don't know if... I mean, you also have like, it. you also have Radiohead, which is constantly innovating in all their, each of their albums, you know, so I mean, it's, I, I think that's, that's, that would be my sort of Absolutely. example of that, you know, so I mean, yeah. it's a choice you make and you stick with that. And I mean, for, I mean, from the beginning, I've always done very disparate things. So I, there's no reason for me to, you know, not do that. Right. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and now with different forms and other medium, like it's split wide open even more, let's say. So now there's, there's more materiality in, in the way I'm conceiving different mm -hmm. projects and different forms. And you know, so. Right. Yeah. Just as an offshoot before we wrap up, there are two other questions, but oh God, I think I have so many more questions coming in. Yeah. Okay. But I just wanted to know, um, you know, do you think like this move to materiality, you know, it's happening with a lot of practitioners suddenly, like, and it's not, maybe not so suddenly, I think maybe we're seeing it more now. And so it seems like a larger movement, but it's always been a question. It's always been a process. Um, but I've always been curious about whether there was a particular trigger point um, that kind of moved the focus into materiality so much more, uh, you know, whether it is. Actually, to be very honest, like if uh, I, I mean, 
I've actually like I've always been very more like much more drawn to like sculpture and installation work than photography. Like, right. I mean, I mean, I photography has been my prime medium. But as I was saying, right. like I did film before. The fascination before. has been. Oh. I mean, the stuff that I imagine when I go to sleep, I'm thinking of like a Boltanski's exhibition that I went to and just blew my mind. You know, for example. Right. Right. Or uh, something that I saw seven years back in Paris when I was not even a photographer. I was studying science in yes. in France. Is something that re has remained with me. Is like I keep going back to that in my mind and in my imagination. For example, but hmm. even like in the last three years, for example, I've had more chance to. I go to Europe and have luckily, right. uh, fortunately, and ha go mm -hmm. to a lot more of more exhibitions. I've always gone like and spend more time at the at the sculptural like at the sculptural installation retrospectives and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's what I've been always drawn to for some reason. And and now with the pandemic, I kind of like and I had been jotting these thoughts down of what I wanted to do as points of departure from my own projects, and then. They had been lying idle, and hmm. all of a sudden, sort of, I came back and with like I was sitting at home during this pandemic time, and then sort of like I was like, okay, let's get down to it, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I have one of my students who lives close by, and he's also brilliant. One of my photography students, and he's also like a brilliant illustrator artist himself, and mm -hmm. he knows my work quite well. So I kind of commissioned him to create the the illustrations. So we've been doing them okay. together. Okay. And uh, and uh, because uh, I mean, because when I was teaching him, like I discussed my work in depth, and he understands what I do with my project. So the collaboration has been it's still going on, but it's it's been beautiful in that sense. You know, like mm -hmm. I don't have to tell much, but he gets what I'm saying, and then we develop these sort of. We've been developing these uh, installation thought experiments, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah. So right. that's that's. Uh, yeah, that sounds, that sounds yeah. good. Um, we have another question saying, seeing most of your work for the first time and absolutely love it for the imagined world and also its political commentary. It's smart and comical altogether. How do you see yourself and your work within the larger, for, within the larger photography world or art space in India and the subcontinent? Well, I mean, there are two things. One is, I think, uh, the first part is more like very interesting for me is the idea of humor, mm -hmm. and uh, with picnic and then also with dinos. Uh, I mean, I wanted to see explore humor as a form in photography. So we were talking about political work and then also the idea of humor. And I think there, like, there is a lot of scope to do that, and I don't see too much. So I wanted mm -hmm. to do that from the beginning, and yeah. uh, in in various projects, I've been trying to push forward this idea of like creating not to, I mean humor in multiple forms the satire or there's you know like there's more mm -hmm. slapstick it's a mixture of multiple things and yeah. and uh, humor is one of the big sort of block exploration forms in um, so exploring photography as a political space exploring photography as a space for humor these are very important facets of how I conceive of photography uh, mm. and I mean image making let's say um, a lot of the time it tends to be very serious expository work and I mean, I, I try to not to go right. in, in, in that direction. Yeah. yeah. So, and I mean, where I stand with, uh, I, I don't really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I see what everyone else is doing. And I mean, I work as a curator if and when there is an interesting project to take up. So uh, I'm, of course, seeing a lot of different things as well. But uh, uh, I, I don't really think of like, I don't really question myself as where I stand or I mean, it's, I stand where I stand, you know, like, right. um, uh, I, I mean, my questions more would be like, I see that there is like less political work. So as a reaction to that, I would try to build more political work. I see less mm -hmm. humor. So as a reaction to that, I would try to build more. So of course you constantly look at the space of what's being created and sort of create things that of course, hope, do not repeat but sort of add to the conversation of what photography could do what visuals what image making could do and then what other forms could do also as is the case right, right now so right. that's kind of where i see myself in the broader spectrum and later on like we'll see where that goes and what where you know, it's too early yeah. to say yeah that sounds good yeah. uh there is some uh, there is an anonymous attendee who did say a question I think this was part of our previous conversation which is do you, don't you become a slave of the image if you do that I think if, this if is I more on this what? I think I mean just a 
assessing mm-hmm. by the time this might be on the uh, following a particular aesthetic that you might have for one body of yeah so i mean because because i mean i try to not be a slave of anything really so you know, <laughs> right. uh, so just working on very diverse things at the same time so i mean for me like my my practice really is uh, a practice of plurality on multiple levels like at the same time i'm teaching and doing my own projects and curating let's mm-hmm. say so like so i'm doing that but inside the projects also i'm doing the projects in different ways and right now i'm also looking at different mediums so there's video mm-hmm. there's Instagram. so i mean there's plurality on different levels in the projects and there's a constant fluidity so i'm not stuck right. to anything you know so right. so that's always i mean that's how i've kind of wanted to have my practice and it's kind of becoming that more so right so right. yeah um so anthony wanted to know is the digital platform overtaking the traditional platform like books or exhibitions now would you want to respond? I mean, with, yeah. with, so, I mean, I, as we, talk, we briefly touched on Instagram as, as a mm-hmm. possibility for, so I work a lot with Instagram and uh, I, right now I have five Instagrams with four of them are projects mm-hmm. and, and they are like the Instagram is not really a dissemination of news of what's right. happening to me or, or one or two images of different projects. It's really the project itself. So I'm using Instagram as a language, as a space for active image making. So the narratives are created on Facebook. I find Facebook an extraordinary space because you can use, you can create narratives using video, using multiple images, using archives. You can do, you know, it's a, and so I've been exploring Instagram as a digital medium to create projects for some time. And um, so that's, that's, uh, that's one thing. Uh, I think, I mean, digital platforms, I think, I mean, Instagram is the one that I explore the most, let's say. Um, uh, I think, I mean, the book, I think, is a beautiful form. And I have always thought of each project to be, to have some sort of book component uh, in, the, in them. Mm-hmm. And that's something, of course, later on, it depends on how you can make a book. It's subject to multiple possibilities of having funds, of having a publisher, if you're making a book during the pandemic, for example, it's really bad to find distribution, for example, let's say. So, right. you know, there are other, there are always other conditions to making a book, but I always, and, but the exhibition is something that I'm very interested in because a lot of things, uh, different projects can find different representations as book, as exhibition, as, as digital platform. Right. So for example, like, uh, let's say if we take the idea of the dinosaurs, which is being mm-hmm. made, um, it's, it exists as this Instagram project where I'm crowdfunding the logistics and the ID knowledge to create the project. So the digital platform is kind of essential for me mm-hmm. for the project, but then it's also going to become a book in the next two years. And then after that, it's also going to become an exhibition, which I don't decide the exhibition has to be somebody who wants to make an exhibition. Right. So, right. uh, but, uh, but I'm also developing the installation work for dinosaurs as well. So, right, um, right. you know, so, so you know, in my ideal exhibition, I'm, I'm already planning for that ideal exhibition, which would have, if you have the resources and the sort of capabilities, mm-hmm. then I know what form that will take. But mm-hmm. if it doesn't, it will take some other lesser, simpler version, but you know, right. so, but it, as a thought process, I mean, I, I'm always creating these thought experiments of, what the ideal exhibition could be but every project lives on these different platforms i i wouldn't give precedence to one over the other or... mm-hmm. okay um yeah. harshal jariwal actually has this question where it uh, i mean he wanted to know what infrared yeah. photography is but i actually i mean it would be it would be interesting to talk about what it means to you with respect to your work you know because i know you're using infrared for a particular for a particular aesthetic and if you can you know very briefly talk about that um guys thank you for staying on i think we will take another 10 minutes and i know we're going overboard but um, okay i'm gonna show you like a couple of images again like very awesome not, perfect not, not not being let's do it why not and uh, yes. uh there's a lot of stuff but i'll show you like you see this image mm-hmm. i hope you can see it yes so this is an image from the climate change work, which is the third part of my climate change trilogy. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been working with infrared and full spectrum imagery, image making, and this image is one of them. So it creates this very otherworldly atmosphere. Right. And it looks like a dystopic post-apocalyptic space. And that's what right. I've been exploring. On a conceptual level, I'm trying to build the sort of equivalence between the idea of, I mean, we've been talking about, say, the war against terrorism, Mm -hmm. and then now there's the war against the pandemic, and then the war against climate change. So there's a lot of these war imagery, the war, the idea of the war, right, in terminal, in in parlance. So that's something which intrigued me, and I started exploring through the night work in climate change, how a a zone of uh, climate change destruction Mm -hmm. could be uh, could be explored through this idea of a war zone so the infrared imagery is a very specialized uh, work which uh, which has form in surveillance in war zones and i mean the big the big example of course is richard moss and like the great work that he's done with infrared photography and with infrared imagery uh, so i wanted to try and push that a bit more and see what like Infrared imagery at night is a super difficult thing to do, I would say, and uh, because there's very little light, and you have to figure. That's why I was saying, like, it takes a lo- it takes a long time to do. But uh, so this is one image. Um, it it's, it was taken at a spot in Bangladesh where um, these boats are the boats in which the Rohingyas used to come. And okay. in back in in 2017 and 18, you saw these like the the wire and the photojournalistic feed was mm-hmm. inundated with these images of the Rohingya exodus coming in these boats, right? So this is the, an image taken in that spot where these boats were coming. And, uh, and uh, now they're not coming, but this is also a zone which is very volatile as a climate change zone. Like the village has been washed away. So it's a, it's a space which compresses multiple narratives of war as genocide, war as climate change, and looking at it through the filter of like infrared imagery. And uh, and you, this image has this very sort of otherworldly, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, feeling of like this very surreal space where these boats are in preparation for a departure because they have to go because they do not have they cannot stay here anymore. So that's kind of the feeling that I'm trying to create in the in the infrared work. So that's an example of the infrared. Uh, Thanks for imagery. that. Thank you. Um, yeah. I think we're gonna wrap up with uh, Daniel's question. Um, and he's saying, hey, both loving this talk. Thanks, Anne. <laughs> How is the political nature of your works read locally? Does your political views uh, posited in the works cause any reactions, get you in trouble? I think the political nature of the work, particularly Mannequin, is lost on the international audience, which means there are layers for an international audience to discover. Yeah, I mean, I feel a lot of work is lost. The the layers are lost in translation when you when they go when they travel, mm-hmm. and I don't see anything wrong with that because it's impossible for all people to read everything that's ingrained in works, right? So, um, so that's that's one thing which we can't do anything with. But it's important to like it's important to create all those layers in the work and hope that right. some of it is translated or uh, some people would read more into it and others would read other things, but. I mean, you create, you create or you merge all these possibilities in the work and then different people take different things from the works. And I, I don't think anything, I mean, you can't prevent it, but that's, I think it's all right. Like most people are not aware of where India is right now in terms of like living in the genocidal times that yeah. we live in, you know? So, yeah. uh, I mean, a lot of that would be lost on people, but maybe not today, but maybe 10 years down the line, when they look at that work, they would understand what they're looking at. And I think that's the beauty of, photography at least where it's not like it stays it's not i mean the book has been down the images are there and different when if you see them 10 years down the line 20 years down the line whenever they would be read in different ways and that's the beauty and i hope that even if not today someday later on they would uh, you know that reading would uh, you know yeah yeah, but, and I mean uh, I guess also, I mean you got to keep doing what you want to yeah, do yeah yeah i mean i was just going to say i mean in many ways what one can do is put it out there and and yeah. then kind of also allow time to also have these layers accessible you know uh, to a larger sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. larger audience because i mean i think you know and, and then especially when you talk about the kind of layers that do exist in the work i think uh, apart from photography just to understand what's happening in the country like we ourselves are so lost you know like there's there's no 
clear idea of what's happening, even though, you know, even under the purview of kind of being under a fascist regime, it's, it's still the dynamics of how they function is something that kind of surprises us every single day, despite knowing yeah. what it might entail. You know, so yeah. I think a lot of these things, maybe even we will begin to make sense of over sure, a period of time. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, of course. And and the hope yeah. is that that uh, that the work is allowed to exist. Um, I think as of right now, within specifically speaking, contemporary practicing photographers, there hasn't been um, a very large censorship that's happened yet. Um, I think a big part of yeah. that reason is that we are relatively inconsequential <laughs> to the larger narrative and it's true, uh, yeah. you know I mean we've been saved with that to a certain mm -hmm. degree I mean we can mm -hmm. have this conversation and we can talk about this as openly as we are right now but um, if we were political journalists um, I don't think we could do that right now so yeah. I think there's a little bit of um, neglect to the photographers which is working really fantastically for us because i mean photography is always great. badly yeah it's yeah i good. mean we're, so we're, that's... we're definitely inconsequential in what's going on uh, and to a certain degree i get it even because you you know they're um, in the larger concept of like is it getting us into trouble i think um currently those who are kind of being monitored are more literal activists in that sense like people yeah, yeah, are really out on the field and and the kind yeah. of investment of, of time and finances and resources that's being put yeah, yeah. on them um is 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 keeping us you know in a safe space to be able to do this and i mean i think one or of the larger not for very long though not, not for, for very long, long. Yeah, i mean yeah. we we don't know you'll just yeah. wake up one day and realize you know, we're on the other side of the situation. And, and I think we're all anticipating that, but we just don't know when, you know. Um, I think I think one one thing that I would add to that for uh, to Daniel's question, like there are a couple of things. One is that, I mean, mm -hmm. my work is not really that much shown in India, sadly. Like, yeah, I mean, we don't have much space for publication anymore, barring a couple yeah. editors and newspapers or anything like they, neither do they pay nor do they want to publish so I mean none of that happens I mean there's, there's a complete buy over of yeah, what the so, national voice is going to be yeah so yeah. I mean we've always I think me my contemporaries like we've always been operating in that sort of vacuum without a, without much support from like the establishment or the I mean the institutional context in India you know so that's that's always been one case but I think something interesting in what you mentioned Daniel is that right now my biggest fear when I go to work like I go to a lot of very remote regions to work right and in the last two or three years there is this very new thing where I mean I'm very I feel that like the prospect of getting lynched is very strong mm -hmm. Like you are never say like you could end up in a very tricky situation because I work at night and I work with flash photography. It's mm -hmm. getting progressively difficult to do that, you know, because right. um, because people are becoming more suspicious and there's a lot more paranoia in the pervasive. I mean, there's fear the all over. Um, yeah, and know, in the remote the places, country. like people are always asking you, like, why are you here? Where have you come from? You know, what's going on? And that could turn very bad very soon. So that idea of the lynching or being accused of being a child kidnapper and being lynched or, for that yeah. is or something any that... any random scenario that yeah, yeah, you yeah. might even otherwise think is not an offense. I mean, yeah, yeah. very often people are getting lynched just for having an opinion even. Yeah, know? yeah. Uh, and that's happening more and more, I think, because, I mean, the current propaganda technique is, is to just instill fear. You know, yeah. just distrust everything that's happening around you. Yeah. And, uh, and I think if you're able to kind of get that deep into the psychology of the people, um, as, as a political institution, you don't really have to do much because you kind of, you know, create chaos in a very different way. Um, yeah. So to your follow up on that, how long will this last? Um, just got our fingers crossed, I guess. Arko, do you have any predictions on how when this might change I mean, I, it's, I mean you continue as long as you can or you know I mean I mean I, I the, with the times like I mean uh, for, from my perspective I can speak on my things I'm just I end, I'm I'm ending up getting more vocal and more agitated and like feeding that into the works 
-hmm. And as I was saying, like with the installations, like I think if and when they happen, like they are, those are really political. Like they are very, at least as far as I- In your face. Uh... I mean, not in your face, but they are very hard hitting and they, they would make more of a statement mm -hmm. because the, 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 in the dinos, for example, the writing is still very cachet. It's very nuanced. Right. And you need to go into like for who gets it, gets it. But like right. for the, for, uh, but the, the, the installations are more hard hitting and way more political as a statement. So maybe once that happens, like, you know, if, and when that happens, like it's going to get me into more trouble. I mean, I don't know, but you know, let's, I mean, whatever we'll, it's, we'll let's get not, to I mean, it it's when in, we get there. It's in the, yeah. It's in the realm of speculation, but right. stuff like, for example, this lynching and stuff, it's something that like I fear so much and uh, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a very legit fear right now. And that's also come into the process. So a lot of the dino uh, write-ups involve the idea of being randomly lynched for mm -hmm. no reason at all, you know? So yeah. these, like my personal experiences of India right now feed into the projects in very strong ways as well. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, I am going to request if we can wrap it up there. Although this has been an amazing conversation. Um, thank you so much, Arko. Thank you for sharing your work, but also thank you for sharing works that we haven't seen and processes that we are going yeah. to see the manifestation of soon. And as Chuchi said, we will all see your curation much, much sooner, it yeah. seems. Uh, yeah. Arko is also um, one of the curators uh, for the coming Chennai Photo Biennale. Uh, Oh, well, we, uh, Daniel has another question, Arko, and I think that's a good note to wrap it up on. How do you get better looking as, as you get no, older? No, that's, that's incorrect. I'm, I'm just getting like, my hair is all falling away. So <laughs> but I disagree with, so that's very <laughs> sweet of you, Daniel. <laughs> very, very kind and sweet of you. I think maybe it's, it's uh, being indoors and kind of just sitting and there's some hair oil massage that's happening as, <laughs> as we do this. No. I don't nope, think not yet. none of that's happening. No. But, but thanks so much. Thank you for, for today. And um, thank you for sharing so much, not just in terms of photography, but also in terms of what impacts you and what concerns you and what gets you moving out from one place to the other. Um, this was a really, really lovely chat. Uh, thank you everyone for staying on. Thank you for staying on, even though we did go overboard. But I mean, I don't think there's any such thing as talking too much. So I'm quite happy to go on. Um, we'll see you next Friday. Thank, I, I just want to say thank you everyone for, uh, for being, for listening, for listening on and to you for inviting me as well. Yes. And we, we are looking forward to what's coming up ahead, you know, yeah. uh, until then we will read, read more stories about dinosaurs who are dealing with many complex things while we sit quarantined in our homes <laughs> right yeah right thank you so much have a nice evening have a great weekend and see you next friday bye bye thank you everyone thanks anshika thanks arko i'm going to end but then i'm going to call you and have a chat yeah okay, okay. bye